All right, everyone, please take a seat. Our guest of the evening is about to grace us on stage. Coming all the way from Detroit, Kalindi Ely is a psychonaut, but really he's something closer to a time traveler and a microcosmic, intergenerational rift explorer. Who came here to see Kalindi? We're so lucky to have him here in the Bay tonight. Thank you, Kalindi, for coming out here. Whatever realm he ends up in, it sounds like it inhibits more than just the mind. Kalindi has come here for this talk all the way from Detroit. A world traveler and mycologist has presented on the subject of psilocybin as far away as Norway and as far south as Australia. His exploration and research centers on the high dose of psilocybin mushrooms. Kalindi shares information gleaned from many excursions into the hyperdimensional and interdimensional realms through his direct experiences with doses 20 through 40 to 50 grams of range of mushroom ingestion. Kalindi brings decades worth of traveling and novel states of consciousness to share, coupled with skills of master cultivator exotic mushroom, and lends a power and authenticity to all of his presentations. I know many of you have been following Kalindi for years. Raise your hand if you have been. <laughs> Kalindi remains a student, teacher, and advocate for the hallucinogenic experience. Welcome, Kalindi. Okay, how's everybody doing this evening? Okay, this is, this is not gonna work. Okay, good. I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's great that I can be in Oakland, San Francisco area to uh, give this talk this evening because uh, you all are the pioneers of bringing the mushroom space into the public domain by decriminalizing or putting it at the lowest priority as far as law enforcement. We're trying to do the same thing in Michigan and many different states around the country and many different countries around the world are following the lead of Oakland. So give yourselves a hand. I'd like to thank Dave. Okay. I'd like to thank Dave and the Psychedelic Society and all of you for coming out. It's a great crowd out Saturday night to hear a lecture rather than being in the club, but maybe we'll hit the club afterwards. My start in this space. Sound man? Is, is it, can I get this one? Don't lie. All right. Okay, that's good. All right. So I am an explorer. I think that the psilocybin mushroom hallucinogenic, entheogenic, and psychedelic mushroom is the quintessential hallucinogen of this planet because it is the oldest plenum of knowledge. It is the one that we encountered first and it is the oldest because fungi is older than plants, animals, and all of the other kingdoms of the earth. So I use that as my most prominent psychedelic. I've did the others, you know, many of them, not all of them, you know, DMT and salvia and boga and different psychedelics, 5-MeO, the toad, but I'm of the persuasion that mushrooms are something that is special. 
They're magical. They don't say magical ayahuasca. <laughs> and mushrooms are many times kind of overlooked because it's a different, it's a different paradigm, even though it's a form of DMT. In other words, if you take ayahuasca and you divinely purge, you're divinely purging. But if you take mushrooms and you throw up, you're just throwing up. <laughs> Started for me quite a ways ago. I've, I've earned every gray in this beard. I've seen life, I've had children, I've been loved and been in love. I've had houses and lost houses and fortunes and lost fortunes and trying to make another fortune now. But there's always been something special in my life. The novel, the explorative, going where no man or woman has gone before. Seeing things that have never been seen before. Absolutely knowing that there is something more. Not believing or listening to the tale that there are novel entities out here. You know, many a night, a long night, the predator has been chasing the alien through my bedroom. Because high dose is something different. Most people go along with the medical model. They're pursuing psychedelics for depression or post-traumatic stress disease or some other malady or psychological difficulties. That's not why I'm in the space. I'm in the space for pushing the pedal to the floor exploring states and places that are so different and so foreign and so crazy many times that it challenges the spirit. But that challenge of the spirit builds a tenacity. It builds courage. It builds power. So many times when I'm speaking at different conferences, whether it be wherever in the world, there's a group that say, well, that guy, <clears throat> that guy Kalindi, he's kind of extreme. We wanna, we wanna keep it manageable. <laughs> I'm not in the manage manageable space. So I speak to a particular group of psychedelic utilizers that push for those types of experiences. Started out for me, um, it was 1957, and I was in the drive-in with my mother and father and my little brother. We were in the back, dropped the popcorn, and I looked up over the seat, and this is the guy that I saw. This, this is the Cyclops from the seventh voyage of Sinbad. And it set me on a quest in my life to see weird stuff. <laughs> Made an impression on me. And ever since I saw this guy, I wanted to see something like that for real. But everybody told me, oh, there's no such thing as that. There's no such thing as dragons, or there's no such thing as Superman, or there's no such thing as this, no such thing as that. But I found out that it is. It's not in the so-called three-dimensional five-sense reality of which we are embedded in, of which physics controls us, meaning that if I step off this stage, I'm going to fall and hurt myself. Same thing that I tell myself in the midst of a 30-gram trip. Because people say, well, if you take that much, you're going to think you can fly and jump out the window. No. 
You say on 30 grams when you're trying to make it to the bathroom because a 30 gram trip or a 20 gram trip or a 25 gram trip, you're not out in nature walking amongst the trees or sitting at the couch looking at Beavis and Butthead or <laughs> Family Guy. I do know a guy who got stuck in the TV smoking salvia looking at, um, I think it was Family Guy. His wife was in the TV and he went in the TV to get his wife and, well, salvia is crazy. We're not even gonna speak about salvia tonight. <laughs> but while trying to make it to the bathroom, and the bathroom is a special place for me also because I always get stuck in the bathroom. <laughs> Mirrors are another dimension. So always trying to make it to the bathroom, I try to, like, I try to make it to the toilet before I look at the mirror. I can look at the mirror on the way out, but if I look at the, the mirror on the way in, then it's, you know, morphing and, you know, I'm saying, am I in the mirror or I'm in the, am I in that bathroom or I'm in this bathroom? <laughs> so sometimes you never know what's going to happen coming out of the bathroom because you can open the bathroom door and there's absolutely nothing out there. No house, no world, no other side of the room. Then I can be where I grab the bathroom door knob and the bedroom's right across the hall from the, from the bathroom. I open the door, walk the four steps or three steps over to the bedroom because that's my place of travel. I'm not walking around up and down the street or anything like that. So I go to the bedroom door. I put my hand on the knob, I open the bathroom door, I mean, excuse me, the bedroom door, and I'm back in the bathroom with my hand on the knob. <laughs> then, you know, I say, now did I walk across the hallway to the bedroom or have I just been standing here tripping, thinking that I'm going across the hallway to the bedroom? I usually make it back. But my bedroom is the place of travel. I don't have candles. Fire is very seductive. You know, you, I'm going to be the fire wizard tonight. <laughs> End up tripping, standing in the middle of the street with the fire department out there because you'd have burnt the house down. I trip alone. I'm in the bed. That's where I, that's where I move from. So while I'm laying in the bed, after I've taken my whatever amount of grams that I've taken, you know, and I've taken it in many different ways, on pizza, in brownies, lemon tech, smoothies, all different type of ways with Syrian rue, which is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which potenizes the psilocybin, but it changes the signature of it because it has the harmalins in it, the beta carbolase, and it also has pinaline in it. So it changes the signature of the psilocybin. So I've done it many different ways. And I don't always do 30 grams or 40 grams or 50 grams. Sometimes you just want to take some and go to the beach and watch the waves. Sometimes you want to go in nature. But to do the real work, the tough work, you do it alone, in darkness, and in high dose. So as I chew, because when I'm doing the hard work, I don't do smoothies or teas or any of those things. I take it and I chew it. That's part of the ritualistic portion of it to get in deep in the space, to chew it and chew it and chew it and chew it. Then I lay down 
on the bed so that the only place I could fall is from, you know, the top of the bed to the floor and hopefully don't fall through the floor. <laughs> then I lay back, I closed my eyes and I called from the bridge to the engine room and I said, Scotty, is warp drive ready? Scotty says, Scotty says, Captain, the engines are ready to go. So I say, Sulu, take us out. And then we're on an adventure. I'm a person who likes adventure because our world is closed off adventure. It's closed off going into places that are new. Everything has been explored, you know, except, you know, the bottom of the ocean or something like that, space. But on a long Saturday night, you can explore more space, more places than you could ever imagine. This, as I said, is something special. That's what they call it, magic. They're not saying that for any other reason other than it is magic. It connects us to the quantum realms of which we're below the Planck length. Super servers that build the macro reality in which we exist, exist. It is the super technology it is where the organizers, because I'm not a, a person who adheres to the historical narrative of the gods. I, I, I believe and wholeheartedly understand that those entities and creatures that in ancient time we called gods that were pushed forward into the modern world, whether it's the, the titans or the as guardians, or the Obosum, or the Orisha, or whatever their names are, exist, because they exist in these spaces. We pull the knowledge and information from the hyperdimensional, extra-dimensional, interdimensional, ultra-dimensional realms back into this space and try to be and parrot ourselves after what we saw in those very special places. The ancient Egyptians, the Neturu, pre-Kemetic priest, pre-Egyptian priesthoods, went out into novel states of consciousness where they met creatures, humanoid in body, but with the head of a falcon humanoid in body with the head of a bull, humanoid features with the head of a crocodile. It spoke perfect English or whatever your language was or is because they're the super beings. They can speak any language or you either have your universal translator with you, which is, you know, can be today called Google. So these things, pyramids, temples, great halls of knowledge and learning are only reflections of what we experienced in the hyperdimensional realms. Helena Petrova Levatsky, Annie Besant, C.W. Leadbeater, the end of the 19th century into the 20th century, they wrote books about what were called information from what they called the Akashic Records. We call it the Akashic Records. In other words, the DMT, Compendium of Knowledge and Information. The great record halls of the multidimensional realms of which we had access to. The mushrooms are an access point to the mystery. 
found very early that when ingesting mushrooms, walking on the Sahara when the great forests were receding and grasslands were being produced. And we moved out of the forest into grasslands and met large predators, large animals that were on the grasslands, hunting and gathering, looking for food. We encountered a rare hallucinogenic mushrooms. I'm talking about in a time where not a person on earth had a pair of shoes. Nobody was wearing clothes. That the main work of the day was finding food. Nobody stopped on Sunday. Oh well, we, we you know we can we can't work today because you know uh, God said you know you got to have a day of rest. No, you had to eat every day, so you were in the space of finding food. And when we encountered that mushroom, we found out that it gave us several adaptive advantages. Mushrooms at low dose, it gave what was called visual acuity. In other words, it made you see better. The colors became more vibrant. You could see it a, a further distance. And that for a hunting and gathering group is an adaptive advantage because you can see your predators at a farther distance which will help you get away because men and women can basically outrun any animal except for wolves and a few others after 100 yards. You can outrun a lion. If you can get ahead of it and outrun it for 100 yards, a lion is going to slow down and stop. You can see that with zebras. They get behind them, if they don't catch them, they'll start trotting and look for another slow one. Second level of ingestion with psilocybin, which is the constituent inside of the mushroom, the chemical in the mushroom that gives you a portion of the trip because it dephosphorylates into psilocin, which is the usable form. Second level of ingestion gives central nervous system arousal. In other words, it's a true aphrodisiac. Not like many of the aphrodisiacs that people say are aphrodisiacs would just give genital itching, you know. And so, you know, since it's itching, you know, with the guys, you know, if it's itching, you might as well use it. But central nervous system arousal is in the male erection. It's an antsy feeling. You can't go to sleep. So it's just a higher level. You know, you got an erection now. You can't go to sleep. So you might as well use it. That is a adaptive advantage to a species because you're going to have more copulations, which means you can have more children, which means those children, you can have more children that grow to the age of majority where they can have children, and the genes are pushed forward, and here we are today. Almost 10 billion, or 8 billion. Then the third level of ingestion, it creates a monosome. Or in other words, it gives you access to the mystery. A mystery that is just as much a mystery today as it was 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, a million years ago. And modern living, modern sensibilities don't give you any one-upsmanship on this. Matter of fact, it's kind of like, you know, you're at a disadvantage. More time passes into modernity, you become more and more disadvantaged. Because this thing is so wide and so vast, the hole is so deep, there's no bottom to it. You can't learn enough. You can't be ready. When people say, you know, they go on Facebook and email me and things like that and say, how do I get ready for 30 grams of mushrooms? 
I said, you can't get ready for 30 grams of mushrooms. You have to experience it. Now, most of the, the psychedelic space, they'll tell you, don't take more than five grams of mushrooms. Start out with one gram and move maybe to three grams, and five should be the limit. Well, many times these are folks who have a particular agenda inside of the space. They don't want anybody to be uncomfortable. Most people only want bubbles and fairies and little elves and rainbows and being kissed by angels and things like that, but that's only half the space. There's also the challenging portion of it, the dark portion of it, the malevolent portion of it. So I'm not going to stand in and tell you it's all bubbles and rainbows, but they'll tell you don't take more than five because you'll get that other half. The other half is the most important. I've learned more from trips that are supposed to be bad trips because I don't believe in bad trips. I believe that there are trips that are more challenging than others. Every trip you learn from, every trip you learn from, and you learn the most when you get into those challenging situations because it builds your power. It builds your tenacity to go and move and conquer the next level of what you're going to experience and, and, and move towards understanding it. So, I'm an explorer. I'm an adventurer. I'm not here to tell you how to deal with your psychological problems of what happened to you when you were a child or how when you were in Iraq to deal with the trauma of the horrors that you may have experienced there. I'm here to say again, if you want to go where no one has gone before, if you want to see what no one has seen, high dose is the way to go. The spores of mushrooms, the spores of mushrooms are some of the hardest things in nature. They approach the hardness of metals. They are perfectly suited to percolate through outer space. And we believe in literature, in panspermia. I'm not a belief person. I'm a person that I, I know what I'm doing. I've been in this for a little while. I know what I'm doing. I'm not telling you anything that haven't ex it experienced. Because many people in this space, they, they go to the conferences, they speak at the conferences all over the world, Prague and Paris and Amsterdam and London and Australia, different places around the world. They write the books. They purport to be the experts, but did you know that many of them have never taken anything at all? They fake in the funk. Or as Terrence McKenna said, that they take a piss ass amount, in other words, so they're not completely lying, you know, they'll take one gram and say, oh yes, I experienced psilocybin when I was in college back in the 60s. And you know, when uh, across, the, across the, the bay here in San Francisco, I was in Hyde Ashbury and, you know, I was dropping acid with the Grateful Dead and, you know, and they're lying. Because many of them have never taken anything out of fear. And the thing about it is, is that why do they fear? What is the fear? You're going to kill yourself? I 
Aya Stark's last fencing lesson, her teacher, Master Pharrell, said, when you encounter the God of death, what do you say? Not today. I've seen the spirit of death, looked into the eyes of the spirit of death. And what you got to say is not today. Even though I've killed myself a thousand times with mushrooms, you're like, oh man, I done messed up this time. I done killed myself. <laughs> They're going to come in here in the morning. My body gonna be in the bed. I'm gonna be out here floating around. <laughs> I didn't kill myself. What my kids gonna say? You know, and I could just hear this in the news. Psychedelic adventurer Kalinda E. E. kills itself with mushrooms. <laughs> you know. And you get stuck in them kind of loops sometimes. Dang, what am I going to do now? <laughs> Wake up! <laughs> because if you're a psychonaut taking mushrooms and you've never said, oh shit, I didn't took too much this time. <laughs> I'm going to get out of this. <laughs> and if you've never said, this is the last time <laughs> I'm ever going to do this. I had mushrooms in my freezer. I said, I'm not going to do this shit no more. I mean, this is the, that's it. It's finished. I put it in the garbage bag, take it out to the curb, say, I'm, you know, I'm finished. I, I ain't going to no more conferences. I, ain't, I don't want to hear about nothing else new. So I'm sitting up there in the morning, maybe reading or on the computer or something, telling my close friends, yeah, I'm finished. This, you know, y'all gonna have to carry on because this last night was it was too much. Then I hear the garbage truck coming down the street. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man. <laughs> it was like five thousand dollars worth of mushrooms. <laughs> I'm going to <laughs> I go out there, so I'm fighting with the, with the garbage man with the bag. <laughs> no, you can't take this one, you know. And then, after you said you'd never go again, never do this again, walking by the freezer, and it calls you. Lindy, it's time. Time to go. You got family on the other side. Because it's an access point, not just to the hyperdimensional realms, but also to the ancestors. This is where you can go to the places that are unaccessible. You had an argument with your grandmother. Not a real argument, but just a disagreement. And your grandmother stays in Detroit and you stay in Oakland. Your grandmother passes before you got a chance to apologize. So you're hurting. Mushrooms are a way to be able to contact your grandmother in the other realm Make your apologies to be able to breach those realms that many believe are unaccessible because the mushrooms are magic. They come from different dimensions. They're an organic technology that was created by who knows, maybe you. 
created it as a memory device. So that when you got, because you had to come in here naked. Can't bring your, can't bring your pistol with you. You can't bring your, your, your clothes. You can't bring your house, nothing. You come in here naked, screaming. But you have a memory device that can hook you to the mystery of the ages. So the mushrooms come from outer space, but also from different dimensions. They were organized. Organizers, the planters. So when an asteroid or a comet brings spores from a different place and time, and it connects with the Earth and liberates its spores. Those spores find a wholesome environment. They fruit, and then a being that has the necessary blockchain, because I'm a Bitcoin enthusiast, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, the blockchain. Because our DNA is a blockchain. It's a distributed leather, th it's a distributed letter, leather, ledger through our family line. The house that you belong to, not your nationality, that don't mean nothing. The house that you belong to is a distributed ledger of the DNA you hold. And Bitcoin is the psychedelic currency. It's the currency that you use when you get out of here. It's money. You can get some here too, but it's the money you use. Han Solo paid Jabba the Hutt in Bitcoin. Jabba the Hutt was looking for him because they owed him money. He paid him in Bitcoin. They said credits. But you think these folks that are making the movies aren't studying these things and finding out things. Disney is. Disney has been doing it since Fantasia. That's why they're coming out, can't wait for Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness because they get ready to go ham with it. They get ready to do the first Marvel superhero horror movie, and they're going to come with it because they got, number one, folks taking entheogens and coming forward with it. That's how Doctor Strange got to be Doctor Strange because Doctor Strange was a B character in Marvel. They'd always put him with the human torch or they put him with the thing or something like that. He didn't even have his own comic book. But in 1974, they reimagined Doctor Strange into the master of the mystic arts. And how the two men, Frank Bruner and Steve Englehart, who were doing Doctor Strange, made their Marvel comic. They would drop acid and eat mushrooms in the East Village in New York, and that's how they made their deadlines. And they put into Doctor Strange what they saw when they went out into the multi multiple universes of which they were experiencing through the ingestion. So, yes, Marvel, Disney, they do a great research into these things. And they get ready to bring it with the next Doctor Strange and also Marvel moving into the multiverse. But you'll see it as you go to the movies. Impacts. When Solon, who was the ancestor of Plato, went to Egypt, he asked the Egyptian or Kemetic priests when was the last great disaster on Earth? 
they said 9,000 years ago. Between Solon and Plato, that was 600 years. We add two to that, 12,600 years ago, we had what was called the Younger Dryas Impact, where four asteroids or comets or whatever, they just say a extraterrestrial event, that these four comets came over the top of Canada, hit Saginaw, Michigan, one was an air burst, one was a land burst, and one hit in Greenland, excuse me, one hit in Greenland and one hit in the ocean. And what it did was, for 1,300 years, it changed the climate. It plunged the temperatures back into the same temperatures that were in the last ice age in the Pleistocene. North America was devastated. The civilizations that were here, the records that were here, were devastated because the one that impacted at Saginaw, Michigan, hit the, what was called the Laurentide Ice Shelf, or the Laurentide Ice Sheet, which was a two mile thick plate of ice that sat on the top part of North America. The air burst set the whole bottom part of North America into Mexico all the way into South America on fire. And the ocean impact disrupted the North Atlantic current. Because when solar radiation comes in and hits the equator, it's trapped in the water by the salinity of the water. And as, it, as the North Atlantic current brings that water northward, it liberates the heat. And that's how you gain a temperate climate. But all that changed. So it changed the climate of the Earth. We're talking about waves that were something similar to this. I took this out of a movie because these are approximately the size of the waves that came in and also the waves that went out because it flashed, melted fresh seawater and that fresh seawater went out into the Gulf and into the Atlantic. So if we get a good look here, especially that's, that's what I'm trying to find out. It was tall as the Sears Tower, and it basically destroyed a lot of the knowledge and information that was held in North America. People retreated into caves. That's where you get the caveman, Diamond Cave in Kentucky, and other parts of the world, the Anatolian civilization in Turkey. And the people at the time built into their megalithic structures information on how to deal with these things if they come again. Well, this was a horrific event. This was the debris field of the Younger Dry's impact. You notice the debris field is there because it has given us what's called impact proxies. Impact proxies like nano diamonds, microspherials, iridium, platinum group metals, and things like this in a soil layer that perfectly matches 12,600 years ago. 1,300 years passed with Arctic temperatures again. I think Robert E. Howard talked about it in um, his first book. You know, the times that the ocean sunk Atlantis. Y'all didn't see Conan? Uh, go on Netflix and look at it tonight. There was a time when things went crazy. 
We didn't have the information anymore. This is the time when Atlantis was sunk. Atlantis birthed Kemet. That was at the same time as Mesopotamia, Sumeria, Akkadia, and world rebuilding, because these things are the rebuilding of the world. And how we got information on how to produce the technologies that we have today were through entheogenic use. Just like in Silicon Valley, they're microdosing mushrooms and LSD and things like that to be able to think outside of the box. That's why Steve Jobs said that, you know, he didn't want anybody working for Apple that hadn't taken LSD. Because you have to know how to think different, which was one of their slogans. So, I'm gonna move through these real quick, because I don't think we have four hours. But it destroyed the megafauna in North America. There were four types of elephants. They had the short-faced bear, which was twice the size of a grizzly. They had four different types of elephants, of two of which you know about, the mastodon and the, and the mammoth, the North American camel, the dire wolf. So if you're a Game of Thrones friend, a fan and you saw the wolves that were approximately this tall at the shoulders, those walked North America. North American horse, because when the Spanish came to the Americas, there were no horses. Giant beaver. Now that's the size of the beaver that was walking around North America at the time of the younger Dryas. Now, we're going to go extraterrestrial. We're going to go alien. Because the mushrooms are part of that space where you get your aliens and other extraterrestrial creatures through the utilization of mushrooms because you experience and find these creatures inside of the psychedelic space. You want to see aliens? I think maybe 15, 20 grams will give you aliens. How many folks would like to see some aliens? Okay, well, in Oakland, it's the lowest priority. You don't have to worry about them breaking in your house because you, you've taken some mushrooms, you know. All you have to do is go and get in your bed and take the mushrooms, lay down. I'm going to give you the protocol that we have because we don't want to be what people could deem irresponsible. He's just up here saying, take 30 grams or take 40 grams or things like that. But I'll tell you, if you just go and take 30 or 40 grams, you're going to have a long night. <laughs> the protocol we suggest is five dry grams for the first trip, seven dry grams for the second trip, and nine dry grams for the third trip with a sitter. And a sitter, all a sitter does is, if you need somebody to talk to, they talk to you. Maybe you want the light on, they'll cut the light on for you. Maybe you can't navigate good, and they help you to the bathroom. They're not your spiritual guru. They're not going to explain the secrets of the universe to you. They're not going to tell you about your chakras and all that kind of stuff. Well, it's, the problem is, is that your heart chakra is not open, so you need to go in here. No, none of that. That just to make sure you can become confident in yourself. And after nine grams of mushrooms, then if you feel confident in yourself, you can go solo, because that's where the real work works. That's where it starts. Because anytime someone else is there, you're going to get entangled in a trip. Because they're going to be entangled in your trip. 
Your energies are going to merge and mesh, unless, of course, you're doing it with a partner or something like that. You know, you may be having um, mushroom sex, which is true henosis, in other words, becoming one flesh, where you melt into one another and you're flying through the universe as one consciousness, talking, to you, talking without talking, moving without moving. I use a lot of movie uh, metaphors and things like that because usually people have seen the movie, they know what you're talking about. You know, so moving without moving, you know, because they got the new Dune coming out next year. Frank Herbert wrote Dune on mushrooms, for those folks that didn't know. Just like some people write better smoking bud, some folks get inspiration and write better on mushrooms. All of that blue within blue because they're the blue mushrooms and moving without moving, you know, that type of stuff. So you may be having mushroom sex where you and your partner are flying through the universe as one being, connected, melded into one another. Maybe both of y'all heads is on the same body and y'all flying through the universe. But the real work, again, is alone because all of the things that we do that are of the real substance are done alone. You can't die with nobody. You didn't come here with nobody. And all of the things that really push you forward are things that are done alone. And that's really part of the mystery. Because all of this is weaved by our consciousness because of that ever-present understanding that we are alone and to take away that aloneness we have woven all of what we experience. You know, quantum mechanics will tell you, you know, that nothing comes into existence without observation. You know, they used to say if a, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there, doesn't make a sound. But that's not it. If you're not there to experience, the, the, the forest doesn't exist at all. You create the forest by experiencing it. I think Niles Bohr and Einstein had a debate about the moon, you know, and Einstein said, well, I'd like to think if I'm not looking at the moon, it's still there. And Niles Bohr said, well, sorry to bring this up, but when you're not looking at the moon, the moon is not there. This is part of the mystery of which hallucinogens give you the access to be able to verify these things. Now let's get into this PowerPoint here. I'm gonna move through this because it'll be too long. So here. Okay, how we know that Marvel has been doing a lot of study? We have here a infraparticle trip with Ant-Man getting smaller and smaller and smaller, going into the quantum realm, moving through different quantum particles, going smaller and smaller and smaller. This is part of any trips. Now, this is not the trip. <clears throat> this is on the way to the trip. <laughs> he hasn't got to the basement yet. When he gets to the basement, it really gets different. There's a place called the Tassili Plateau at Egeir in Algeria where you have some of the oldest records of hallucinogenic mushroom use. This is a place where there are a series of labyrinth caves where you can see that 
the people who were drawing these things understood how to draw. <laughs> so this is something that they, that they saw, that they drew. They call this the bee shaman. This was made, um, drew, drawn by Cat Harrison, who was the um, wife of Terrence McKenna. This is an actual picture drawn on the walls from 12,000 years ago. And it has mushrooms sprouting out of the body of this humanoid being with a bee's head. These, they call these the dancing shaman. In other words, there have been times where in a group session, I've ate mushrooms and other people have ate mushrooms and people, everybody's head turned into a mushroom. So I can verify that there are mushroom-headed people because I've seen them. And they've seen me with a mushroom head. Now they're dancing with mushrooms in their, head, in their hands. And if you can see the dots of the mushrooms, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but the dots are going to the crown of the head where the pineal gland is in the, in the baby spot, the opening in the head. So again, we see that people knew how to draw cows, they knew how to draw people, they knew how to draw, draw, draw things in their environment. Heads of cows, perfect symmetry and things like that. And then you get this. So where did they get this? It was no precursor for people with boots on. Number one, nobody had no shoes. And they definitely didn't have spaceships, uh, space suits with utility belts on because this is in the same place. So where did they get this information from? You, didn't just, you don't just be walking around one day, naked as the day you was born, and then you go to draw something and say, hey, why don't we draw some people with helmets and space, uh, space suits and things like that on? Where did they get this from? This is what they saw when they ingested the mushrooms. Mushroom-headed folks again. These were the people who drew these pictures at the Tessile Plateau at Egeir. Some of the, these are some of the mushrooms, these are some of the African mushrooms, because when we look at mushrooms, we usually look at Mexico, South America, and places like this. Although there are mushrooms all around the world, they're in Thailand, they're in Cambodia, they're in Australia, and don't let folks tell you that uh, Australian Aborigines don't use mushrooms and things like that because they do. It's not just dream time. The dream time is mushroom time. This is the Duna mushroom of the Fang people who are, these are the Fang people. They ingest a, a particular mushroom. It's in the Congo. Now, National Geographic did Africa a disservice for over 100 years. Where they would go into particular ceremonies and say, this is how the Africans walk around every day. Now, can you imagine cooking dinner, bringing in water, uh, breastfeeding the baby or whatever, and you got this suit on? No, this was a special time. But they use this to put forth the information in Africa, there's wild people there and things like that. And, you know, they wear crazy costumes and things like that every day. But when I was in London at the Breaking Convention Conference speaking on these same things, I said, now what if National Geographic took these pictures and said that this is the Englishman. This is how he walks around every day. You see the red on his face? That's because that's blood. He's been eating people. 
wouldn't want to go to London or Manchester or Birmingham because you think the wild Englishmen would eat you. It's all dealing with perspective. This is Demeter and Persephone. Demeter is now an older woman, this is her mother. She's no longer bleeding, her sexuality is liberated to herself, not to producing children, and she is giving the secrets of the female sensibilities and mushrooms to the younger woman so that she can now go on her journey. And she's springtime and winter and birth and all those different type of things. You know, we have uh, a couple of times a year in Michigan, we have group trips. We have an all men's trip where all of the men take five grams and you know, we fight werewolves and decloak Klingon death cruisers and you know, chase aliens through the cornfields and things like that. Then about a month later, we have an all women's mushroom trip. And they do the goddess thing, birthing universes out of their wombs and you know, all of those different type of things. Then, I don't know why we started doing this, we have the group of men and women together take five grams and you know, that is, you know, it, it, sometime it doesn't work. <laughs> this is Ansar. Osiris in Egypt, the lord of the underworld, lord of the perfect black. Now when he says the underworld, they're not talking about it like the Christian sensibility, like hell and you're going to get burned up. What they're talking about is that he is the lord of the quantum realm, where things are produced that we utilize in our daily existence, like wood and metal and flesh with the collapse of the wave into the particle which creates the illusion of solidity because we know that even though it's solid it's 99% space. This is the ceremony of the opening of the mouth of the mummy. The open them, opening the mummy's mouth because over here on the food of the table of the gods you have mushroom caps. They consider the mushroom caps female and the stems male. So what they're doing is opening the mummy's mouth so that he can then take those mushroom caps, put it in his mouth, and then he can then get to the gate of the next life. This is a technology. It's not just something that you look at. At low doses, this becomes animate. In other words, when you're looking at it, the characters start moving around. At a higher dose, the characters, while moving around, come off of the wall into your environment. Then at higher doses, you go into the world and experience what the world is like and you bring back pyramids and temples. Entities with human bodies and the heads of falcons. The technology of the ancient world was the mushroom. This is a depiction on how you Merged with the technology to gain knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. I put this mushroom next to this to show the same mor morphology. This is the Archdiocese Catholic Church in my neighborhood in the city of Detroit. Doorway is the doorway of knowledge, but it has the mushroom glyph, which is the stem 
and the cap. This is the doorway at Notre Dame before, um, you know, they, they set it on fire um, last year after they took everything out so that they could get repairs, you know, new floors and new roof and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> okay, here I am standing in front of that same door. Um, a year or so ago. So you can see the, the side, the actual size of the door. And again, you have the stem and the mushroom cap. And these are the ancestors of Catholicism that reside inside of that mushroom. Here is a mask, an African mask. Again, it's a technology. You put the a mask on, you eat the mushroom, and you can see where you get this, because there's a world inside of the mushroom. There's an artificial intelligence going on. Just like inside of Iron Man's mask, you have things going on. You have the ancestors. And then this can be projected out into the community, which takes the mushrooms also, and there's a shared experience. So. The person who's in the mask is going around projecting what he's experienced inside of the mask into the community so that there's that shared experience. Let's try. Okay. Yes. All right. This is from a, a statue of the sacred bull because. Magic mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms, their natural environment is cow dung. They grow on cow, cow patties. So while searching for food, men and women found that when they ingested the mushroom, it gave those three different levels of ingestion. But over time, human beings learn to cultivate mushrooms. And I'm an advocate of people learning how to grow mushrooms. I think outside here, one of the tables that you can stop at out there, and they have grow classes, mushroom grow classes, because you want to be able to, you want to be able, should have had this an hour ago. But learning how to grow mushrooms yourself is the way to go. That way you don't have to get them from anybody else, unless you go into Dave's, of course. Um, but you learn how to grow yourself. And it gives you more of a relationship with the mushrooms that you grow yourself than those that are grown by somebody else. And it gives you a new knowledge, a new skill, because these things actually changed the modern world. When Gordon Watson went to visit Maria Sabina and got the magic mushrooms in Oaxaca, Mexico, and he came back and wrote an article for Life magazine in 1957 seeking the magic mushroom, it changed the whole paradigm of what we were embedded in in the 1950s and gave us the 1960s. You see, because before we were eating mushrooms and dropping acid, because mushrooms were too slow, and once they found out acid that, you know, to undergraduates in a weekend can make a million doses, it was pretty much all over. But before that, nobody cared anything about any whales. Nobody cared, cared about the porpoises. Nobody cared anything about trees. What do you do with a tree? You cut it down, you know, not that they're not still cutting them down, but those people, we have to get them and get them some mushrooms so they'll stop. But people started hugging trees 
It was no environmental movement. It was no gay movement. It was none of those things before mushrooms and LSD and those things liberated people's consciousness and got them out of the rut that we had been stuck in. It even saved the world at least once. Mary Pinchot Meyer was John F. Kennedy's girlfriend, one of his 30 girlfriends. They said that Mary Pinchot Meyer was the only woman that could take JFK from Marilyn Monroe because Marilyn Monroe was basically, that was a character. You were dealing with Norma Jean, a, a, a woman who was supremely depressed and she wasn't Marilyn Monroe, which you see in the movies. But Mary Pinchot Meyer was his go-to girlfriend because number one, she liked threesomes and foursomes and stuff like that. You know, they were snorting cocaine, smoking bud, and dropping acid in the Oval Office. Mary Pinchot Meyer was getting the acid from Timothy Leary, and she had a plan to take all the East Coast debutantes from Vassar and all of those different, you know, high-class female colleges and take those debutantes and turn on the, um, the, the Senate and the House and get everybody to love each other and have no more wars. But the LSD that JFK was dropping basically changed his mind about retaliating against Russia with Khrushchev and things like that during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So Mary Pinchot Meyer never got a chance to put her program into action because JFK got killed in Dallas not long after that. Mary Pinchot Meyer didn't agree with the Warren Commission because people were trying to kill her and ultimately what they did was in Georgetown they killed Mary Pinchot Meyer as she was walking uh, in Georgetown not long after they killed JFK. So they killed JFK and they killed Mary Pinchot Meyer because she had a lot of information on people and things like that, even the ones that they did uh, get the LSD and things too. So it saved the world at least once during the Cuban Missile, missile Crisis and stuff like that. But this bull ate the Phalaris grass. As I said, the DMT compendium of information, because psilocybin mushrooms, the psilocybin is 4-phosphoryloxy nn dimethyltryptamine. It dephosphorylates when ingested into psilocin. And psilocin is basically DMT. And mushrooms at high dose are indistinguishable from DMT. You just have to be able to take the space for two and a half hours rather than 15 minutes. Because, you know, 20 minutes. Because DMT is going to be 15, 20 minutes. The mushroom is going to be two and a half hours at the peak. And you got to be able to stay and stand in there, you know, because once you get in, you can't get out no way, so it doesn't make much difference. These are mushrooms on cow dung. This is the dung beetle, which pushes the dung across the, the land, uh, picking up spores. And when the baby beetles come out, they eat the dung and the mushrooms that fruit from the dung. This is where we get the sacred beetle in Egyptian iconography. Scarification. You're more familiar with the tattoo. These are gills of which hallucinogens are hooked to because the tattoo is the identification and empowerment of what is in the other realms brought into this realm of existence. The man here, these markings are what 
are in what would be called this auric field. In other words, the tattoo artist is not a person who can do what they want to do. They have to do what's on you. In other words, they can't put mom on there or, you know, some Chinese characters or, you know, you say you want a duck on your thigh or something like that. They can't do that. They have to put on exactly what is on you already. Because the elders of this thing, if you just went and put, on, put whatever you want on the person, you know, that's like a death sentence in the olden days. Now, of course, we, you know, folks get all kind of stuff. They want flowers and trees and birds and bees. Well, this is a spiritual technology. Under the influence of the mushroom, these things are moving around this guy's face. They're animate. They're his spiritual power brought into the physical realms. These are some mushrooms. Took a picture of these because they were nice. Look at mushrooms. Mushroom caps. Four prints. The thing about mushrooms is that it's not bad on the environment like Iboga is being over harvested in Gabon. Ayahuasca, you know, the Chacruna and other things are being over uh, uh, harvested. But with mushrooms, you can grow mushrooms with, you know, core vermiculite, rice, Bibles, blue jeans, anything pretty much that has the, the right constituents, you'll be able to grow mushrooms with. And with one mushroom spore print, you can grow mushrooms the rest of your life with one spore print. You never need to buy anything, another spore print, or get another spore print. You only need one. There's millions of spores on that spore print, and when you got spores, you got mushrooms. So mushrooms would then make spore prints, which would then make mushrooms, which would then make spore prints. This is the underside of the mushroom. I want you to remember the glyph, which is the circle within the circle, and this is a subatomic particle from CERN. So it is parroting the same glyph, circle within the circle. This is the tree of life. This is the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, or whatever you want, you know, if you want to go biblical. This is the tree of life. It contains DMT. This is acacia nilotica. It gives you the same space but it is a later rendition of how humans ingested DMT because with this you need something to get past the barriers that the monoamine oxidase in your gut produces to stop DMT from crossing over into your brain. So this is an alchemy. That's why we say that Ayahuasca is a later rendition because it's an alchemy. You have to have a pot, you have to have water. You must have been at the point in your existence where you have domesticated fire, unless you wait for a lightning strike, and, and still you don't have anything to put the water in. But it's an alchemy. Then you have a person between you and the end product. With mushrooms, you don't have anything between you and it. This is the, the pharaoh or the Nisut Biti, which is the, what you would call the president of Egypt, suckling at the breast of the Acacia Nilotica. This is Paganum Harmala. This is the old world ayahuasca from Persia and Egypt, Mesopotamia. This is the old sorcery portion of this, because sorcery is part of this. 
sorcery because most, you know, most of your ayahuasca trips that aren't in tourism are part of the brujo system. In other words, most folks are doing sorcery and they, you know, making your dog die and, you know, your wife go blind and your kid get polio and all that kind of stuff. That's what they're doing with these things. Mushrooms don't usually have that type of sensibility. Those things are usually regulated to things like Datura, which is delirium, but that Datura is, if you want to be Darth Vader, Datura is the one that you can work with to be Darth Vader if you want to be Darth Vader. Move to the dark side. These are the Syrian rue or African rue seeds. to this one. Okay. Can I take it off the, can I take it off? Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I'm not going to keep you much longer. Everybody doing okay? Okay. The, the sensibility I'm trying to convey is that this is something very special and that you can take your time to study, do your research, don't just jump out here because I said do it. If you've never taken anything before, you start low and you work your way up incrementally so that you don't get out in too deep of water because you have some people who are swimmers without no water. They're land swimmers. Then you have people who are out on the shore who you know, they splash water with the kids and they throw the frisbees to the dogs. Then you have some people who get out and they swim, you know, maybe on a boogie board or something like that, but they never go away from the shore. The high doser is the person, they're like SEAL Team 6. You know, they got a wetsuit and some fins and a mask and they get in the helicopter and the helicopter takes them miles out into the ocean and then they jump out the helicopter and then they got to find their way back. That's, that's what I'm talking about. They're out there with the whales and the porpoises and all of that. And they're out in territory that they don't know which way to go. And the thing about this is, with SEAL Team 6, there's your team mates out there with you. What I'm talking about in the high dose is that you're going out there getting dropped, but you're by yourself. See, there's a, a difference between when you have some help or at least some confidence in numbers and being by yourself. This isn't for everybody. I used to think everybody should do it, but I've come to the realization that it's not for everybody. Everybody can't pull this off. I think everybody should have the psychedelic experience. It's just like Sex, I think everybody should have the sexual experience, you know, but it's trying to like explain sex to somebody who's never had sex. You say, well, what's sex like? Well, it, it feels good. <laughs> well, that's not telling me anything, it feels good, you know. It's the same thing with psychedelics. You can't really explain to someone who's never taken it what it's like. And most people who, who've even taken it has not had an entheogenic dose, a dose sufficient enough to push them over the edge to where consciousness is flown open, the doors of consciousness, the doors of perception flown open to where they really move towards understanding what this thing is. It's profound. Another technology. We've all heard of Aladdin and the magic carpet. This is technology. This is where families would take carpets 
you know, of course you had the carpets that were on the floor. But these special carpets that were the technology of your computer hard drive, whereas in the different places, if you see the little football things around the edges, one side could be the ancestors of your maternal line. The other side, the ancestors of your paternal line. The old women would take the young girl, put her on the carpet with the entheogens, find her husband, find the baby that they're going to have, and bring the baby out of the carpet and put the spirit of the baby in the girl before she gets with the boy because the paternal side's got to do the same thing. Then they put them together with the carpet and the baby comes. It's not just, you know, you're walking down the street and you see a nice looking young lady and she got some nice tight jeans on so y'all go to get together and have a baby. This was high science and it's a technology. These are places that you go. The mandala, the Tibetan mandala is a technology. It's a two-dimensional sand painting that's made by the Tibetan priests that become three-dimensionalized. This is where they go to study in the hyper-dimensional realms. This is what that two-dimensional sand painting becomes once you tie it in with the entheogens. And they go in here and study with the Buddhist saints, gain knowledge, discipline. Buddhist tapestry, same thing. Low doses become animate. Medium doses, they come off the wall. High doses, you go into the tapestry. This is a rendition of a particular mandala in a tapestry that is on the wall where he opens the tapestry up. Now, he doesn't go into this one, but this is how it arranges itself once you're under the influence of the hallucinogen, the mushroom, it becomes something that is alive and a place that you go into. So the different statues and iconography of the ancient times when mushrooms were looked at as part of the head. Here we have another technology. Anybody know what that is? Cenobite puzzle box from Hellraiser. Think they just made it up for the movie? Nope. Puzzles, labyrinths are places that you go into as a technology with the hallucinogenic ingestion. So you can go onto Amazon. I wouldn't suggest I wouldn't suggest it, but you can go on Amazon buy one of these toy boxes, take 20 grams, and out of them will come the characters, the Hellraiser characters, Pinhead and the rest of them. I put the challenge together before. I'll sit with you if you're gonna do 30 grams and we can use my Hellraiser box and you can be the person that comes out and says, you know what he said? He was right. <laughs> Yoga, meditation, Qi Gong, Tai Chi. All martial arts have an entheogenic portion to them in the higher levels. Ninjutsu came from mushrooms. Many Styles of swordsmanship come from mushrooms. Arjuna and Krishna in the Mahabharata, in the portion that is called the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna reveals to Arjuna his supreme personality of godhood, 
where he says, what you are, no fire can burn, no water can drown you, no air can make you dry, no earth can cover you, because the true soul exists in the subatomic realms. So these are all things that have been put forward to us because people went into these realms. So as I said, I'm not going to keep you much longer. I think we have a question and answer period coming up uh, also. Where did Dave go? I don't know how much time he wants me to go. But the revealing of the supreme personality of Godhood in yoga, yoga is paired with hallucinogenic mushrooms. Meditation is part of the hallucinogenic experience. You use your meditation and your discipline to be able to make it to the places that you want to without getting distracted by all the things that are going on. As I said earlier, you want to speak to your grandmother because you had that disagreement with your grandmother. So you take the mushrooms and want to go in to speak to your grandmother, but in the midst of that, when you're going to your grandmother, like Ant-Man, something very interesting comes by that takes you off on a tangent, and that tangent makes you forget all about that you were going in for your grandmother, and the next morning, you oh man, I want to go see my grandmother, but you know, the woman in red from the Matrix was walking through the middle of your trip, and she pulled you off the path and put you in a position to where you weren't thinking about grandma anymore, you was thinking about the woman in red. Because we live in a matrix, the way out of the matrix is being able to have access to change the codes. Because if we understand that this is a simulation, embedded within simulations, embedded within simulations, and that it is computer code, instructions from the below plank, plank length supercomputers, then if it's code, it could be hacked. And you can get out of the matrix by understanding that the psilocybin hallucinogenic magic mushroom gives you access to the hyperdimensional realms. Thank you very much. I appreciate you for coming out. I hope you enjoyed some of the things I said. And I guess until, uh, until Dave gets back, I'll open myself up for questions.